On the map of human civilization, there are always places regarded as forbidden zones drawn by the hand of God. They are nature's ultimate barriers, the last blank spaces on explorers' maps and the most stubborn challenges in engineers' nightmares. The Himalayas, the roof of the world straddling the Asian continent, is such a place. It is not only a geographical pinnacle but also a touchstone for civilization and will. Today, we will talk about the Sichuan Tibet Railway. For centuries, countless caravans, monks, and armies have gazed up at this barrier of ice, rock, and fierce winds, ultimately choosing reverence and detour. However, in the 21st century, an unprecedented vision is turning myth into reality. Relying not on yaks and horse caravans, but on steel and wisdom, it seeks to install a pulsating steel artery into this slumbering dragon. The Sichuan Tibet Railway has a total investment of 58 billion US dollars. This sum is enough to rebuild half of Manhattan. Its journey of over 1,600 kilometers is almost equal to the straight line distance from London to Rome. Its 851 kilometers of tunnels and bridges exceed the entire length of Japan's Shinkansen from Tokyo to Fukuoka. This is the Sichuan Tibet Railway, not merely a project of money and concrete, but an ultimate dialogue between human industrial civilization and the planet's most ancient, majestic, and fragile geological environment. To understand the greatness of the Sichuan Tibet Railway, one must first understand its enemy. Its enemy is not any country or army, but the laws of physics themselves. The first enemy is the vertical, from the Chengdu Plain, the land of abundance, at a mere 500 meters above sea level, the railway must climb to the eastern Tibetan Plateau, exceeding 4,400 meters. The relative height difference is nearly 4,000 meters. What does this mean? Imagine stacking nearly five of the world's tallest building, the Burj Khalifa, end to end. This is the vertical ascent the train must overcome. To ensure smooth operation, Engineers have adopted the globally rare switchback technique, allowing the railway to spiral and meander repeatedly through valleys, trading length for height. On certain sections, you can even see from your window the very same track you passed minutes before, now on a lower level. This is not science fiction. This is the wisdom of defying gravity. The second enemy is the fractured. The Himalayas are one of the youngest and most active mountain ranges on Earth. The Indian plate pushes northward at a rate of five centimeters per year, like a century-long collision between two giant trucks. This makes the area along the Sichuan Tibet Railway a museum of geological disasters, earthquakes, landslides, mud flows, rock bursts. It has them all. Over 80% of the line is built on tunnels and bridges. This is not a choice, but a necessity. Let's focus on those 72 tunnels. The longest, the Yigong Tunnel, is 42.5 kilometers long. By comparison, the world-famous Channel Tunnel's undersea section is only 37.9 kilometers. What's more insane is that these tunnels are not excavated on flat ground, but inside mountains at altitudes above 3,000 meters with extremely high geostress. Engineers face geothermal heat up to 200 degrees Celsius, sudden water inrushes comparable to waterfalls, and rock bursts, the violent ejection of rock hard as steel, powerful enough to pierce steel plates. For this, China has developed customized tunnel boring machines, TBMs, with diameters exceeding 15 meters and power equivalent to the combined engines of 20 Formula One cars. These steel behemoths are gnawing their way through the Earth's flesh, day and night. The third enemy is a song of ice and fire. The permafrost of the Tibetan Plateau is another nightmare for engineers. It appears solid but melts into mud in the summer. Building a railway capable of carrying 10,000-ton trains on a foundation like Tofu is akin to constructing a skyscraper on quicksand. The experience gained by Chinese engineers on the Qinghai Tibet Railway, a predecessor to the Sichuan Tibet line, is being applied here. By burying heat pipes and laying insulating layers of crushed rock, they actively cool the permafrost to ensure the permanent stability of the roadbed. Simultaneously, the tracks themselves must withstand extreme temperature differences of over 70 degrees Celsius, from scorching summer sun to freezing winter ice. 
the expansion and contraction are enough to deform ordinary steel rails. Special weather-resistant steel must, like a living organism, remain stable with every breath. This isn't just building a road, it's wrestling with a planet's most primitive and untamable forces. Behind every piece of data lies an ultimate test of human wisdom and courage. Why spend a fortune to tame nature? The answer is development. For Tibet, this railway is not just a transportation line. It is a golden artery carrying hope and wealth. First is the liberation of resources. Tibet is far from a barren land. It is hailed as the kingdom of non-ferrous metals, with nearly one-third of the nation's copper reserves and world-class lithium reserves. And lithium is the white petroleum, driving the global electric vehicle and energy storage revolution. In the past, these treasures were locked deep in the snowy mountains, with prohibitive transportation costs making development difficult. The cost of transporting one ton of goods from Tibet to Chengdu was even higher than shipping it from Guangzhou to Europe by sea. The Sichuan Tibet Railway will change this completely. It is predicted that the railway will reduce logistics costs by at least 40%-50%. This means Tibet's mineral resources can be integrated into China's and even the global supply chain with unprecedented efficiency, potentially bringing an economic wave to the region comparable to the 19th century gold rush in the American West. Second is the reshaping of time space and the upgrading of industries. The 48-hour bumpy ride from Chengdu to Lhasa will be compressed into a 13-hour high-speed journey. This is not just a reduction in time, but also a closing of psychological distance. For tourists, the mysterious Potala Palace and the magnificent Yarlung Tsangpo Grand Canyon will no longer be unattainable dreams. It is estimated that after the full line opens, it will bring over 35 million new tourists to Tibet annually, a number nearly four times the entire population of Switzerland. Hotels, catering, cultural and creative industries. A vast tourism chain will be activated, creating hundreds of thousands of jobs. The more profound impact lies in breaking Tibet's long-standing internal economic circulation. High-quality highland agricultural products, like highland barley and matsutake mushrooms, can reach the dinner tables of China's eastern coast within 24 hours. Meanwhile, advanced medical equipment, educational resources, and industrial goods can be rapidly and stably imported to the plateau. This is a two-way empowerment, a complete reshaping of the economic structure. However, as the train of progress whistles in, it may crush more than just railway sleepers. Every coin has two sides, and this grand project, the Sichuan Tibet Railway, could also be a Pandora's box. The alarm bell rings first for the ecosystem, the Tibetan Plateau is known as the third pole of the world and the water tower of Asia. The Yangtze, Yellow River, Lankang, Mekong, New Salween, and Yarlung Tsangpo, Brahmaputra. Ten of Asia's most important rivers originate here, nourishing over two billion people downstream. The ecosystem here is extremely sensitive and fragile. Once damaged, it is almost irreversible. The construction of the railway is, in itself, a drastic intervention. Tunnel excavation may cut off underground water veins, altering local hydrological environments. Bridge construction, even with 16 crossings of the Yarlung Tsangpo River, cannot completely avoid impacts on aquatic life. More worrying is the potential fragmentation of wildlife habitats. Will the migratory corridors of snow leopards, Tibetan antelopes, and brown bears, these spirits of the plateau, be permanently blocked by this steel great wall? Although engineers have designed dozens of wildlife passages, their effectiveness remains to be tested by time. What follows is an exponential increase in human activity. What kind of garbage disposal pressure will tens of millions of tourists bring each year? A single discarded AA battery can contaminate one square meter of land for decades. In the thin air of the plateau, the decomposition rate of vehicle exhaust and domestic waste is much slower than in the lowlands. Is this railway a green corridor bringing vitality to the plateau, or a fast track to ecological disaster? This is an unanswered question. The railway brings not only flows of people and goods, 
but also flows of ideas and cultures. For the Tibetan people who have lived on this land for generations, this is a profound social transformation filled with both opportunities and challenges. On one hand, the railway undoubtedly opens a door to the outside world for the younger generation. They can more easily pursue education and employment in the interior, encountering more diverse cultures and broader opportunities. Improved medical conditions allow for the treatment of many diseases that were once helpless on the plateau. From this perspective, the railway is a bridge to modernization and a better life. But on the other hand, a deep-seated anxiety is spreading. As large numbers of tourists, business people and laborers pour in, and as standardized Mandarin and uniform business models become mainstream, will the living space of the Tibetan language be squeezed? Will unique religious beliefs, customs, and art forms be diluted by homogenized consumerism, eventually becoming a cultural landscape for display? This paradox of development has played out in many indigenous regions worldwide. Economic improvement is often accompanied by the blurring of cultural identity. How to embrace modernization while safeguarding the roots of one's own civilization? This is not just a question for the government to ponder, but also an internal struggle that every individual within it must face. Elevating our perspective to 10,000 meters, the significance of the sichuan Tibet Railway has long surpassed economics and culture. It is a key piece placed on the geopolitical chessboard. For China, it is first and foremost a lifeline for national security. It greatly enhances the central government's ability to manage and mobilize resources in border regions. In responding to natural disasters or emergencies, the efficiency of transporting personnel and supplies will increase exponentially. The most direct audience for this railway is undoubtedly its neighbor to the south of the Himalayas, India. For a long time, China and India have had territorial disputes in the southern Tibet region. The railway's terminus, Niinchi, is just a step away from this disputed area. From India's perspective, this railway places it at a significant strategic disadvantage. In the event of a conflict, China could transport large numbers of troops and heavy equipment in a short period via the railway, completely altering the regional military balance. India's concerns are not unfounded. Globally, this railway is also a potential extension of China's Belt and Road Initiative. In the future, if even greater engineering obstacles can be overcome to extend the rail network southward to connect with Nepal, Pakistan, and even reach the Indian Ocean, it would open up a land-based strategic corridor for China that bypasses the Malacca Dilemma. Then, oil from the Middle East and minerals from Africa could enter China's heartland directly by land, avoiding the narrow and easily controlled strait. This would fundamentally rewrite the global energy and trade landscape of the 21st century. In 2030, when the Sichuan Tibet Railway is expected to be fully operational, it will not be the end of a story, but the beginning of a grander, more complex era. Do you think this sky road leads to heaven or? Share your thoughts in the comments section.